started. Well, hello everyone and welcome today. This is lecture number three out of a part, um, a four part series on benzodiazepines uh, through the Colorado Consortium's prescription uh, or for prescription drug abuse prevention. And today we'll be discussing benzodiazepine induced neurological dysfunction, which we'll call BIND for short. And this is from the perspective of the patient experience. Next slide. I am Christy Huff. I direct Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, a nonprofit that ed, uh, educates about the adverse effects of benzodiazepines. I'm also a cardiologist, and I'm on the steering committee committee of um, the consortium's Benzodiazepine Action Work Group. And I am D.E. Foster. Um, people just call me D, the first initial. I founded a site called Easing Anxiety, which provides um, information and support to people dealing with BIND and um, benzodiazepine withdrawal. And I'm host of the Benzo Free podcast. I am co-chair of the Colorado Consortium's Benzodiazepine Action Work Group. And I wrote a book titled Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. And this is a brief outline of what we'll be covering today. Dee and I will both share our uh, story, our lived experience with benzodiazepines. We'll share the results of a um, survey on benzodiazepine experiences. We're gonna talk about the definition of BIND and also its resulting life effects. We'll talk how uh, currently patients with BIND face a lack of support. Uh, we'll talk about the non-medical or non-medication management of symptoms. Um, and then lastly, some resources for both patient and prescriber. And uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to start with sharing just the one minute version of my story. In 2015, I was prescribed 0.25 milligrams of Xanax. Uh, it was a take for sleep that I was, I was having difficulty sleeping during a health crisis. Within three weeks, um, I developed physical dependence, tolerance, and symptoms of interdose withdrawal. Um, after I figured out what was happening, I used the Ashton method to, um, to taper off. I switched to Valium because the long half-life, you know, helped facilitate tapering. And, but even reductions with the Ashton method were too large for me. And so later on, I transitioned to a method called micro taper. Uh, where I did um, you know, daily micro reductions. And this process took me over uh, three years to taper off. And I was pretty sick the entire time that I tapered. Currently I'm three years benzodiazepine free. And while I still am quite a bit better than I was during my taper days, I do have um, protracted symptoms related to the benzodiazepines. During and even after my taper, I experienced 80 different symptoms. Um, some of which I've listed here. I think the worst things for me were this feeling of a chemical terror. Um, I had postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. I had memory problems, cognitive impairment, suicidal ideations, intrusive thoughts, um, an internal tremor that felt like I was uh, plugged into an electrical socket. And, you know, the worst part was not just that I had a laundry list of symptoms, is that this profoundly impacted my life. I was unable to work. Um, there were times where I was not safe to drive, could not drive, uh, had difficulty caring for my child and managing my household, and difficulty with just basic self-care tasks at points during my taper, including just taking a shower or cooking a meal for my family. And there were times I was bedridden. After my experience, um, I became an advocate for um, safe benzodiazepine uh, prescribing and deprescribing. I'm going to pass the torch here to Dee now. Thanks, Christy. Um, I was on clonazepam for 12 years, uh, one to two milligrams daily, taken as prescribed by my primary care um, physician for gastric, gastric distress. I was provided no warnings that there was any complications or possibility of dependence. I did direct, direct taper once I discovered that this was causing problems and might be difficult for me to, um, to taper from. I did a direct taper for 18 months. I am now seven and a half years off um, clonazepam. I am still in a protracted condition. I have daily symptoms and limitations on my life. Some are significant. I had over 50 distinct symptoms. Many were severe, including extreme anxiety, panic attacks, depression, um, cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, which still lingers. I did have some suicidal thoughts a little bit. I had achesia, still have that. Facial paresthesia, um, personality chains, vertigo, plenty of them. 
I was also misdiagnosed during this time and misdiagnosis is very common for people in BIND. I was misdiagnosed with prostatitis and prescriber fluoroquinolone, which I'll come back to in a minute. And then of course, um, there were a lot of lifestyle effects much as um, Dr. Huff had shared. I lost my career. I worked in IT as a database programmer and I'm unable to return due to the stress and cognitive um, requirements of that position. I lost a lot of my freedom, lost my sense of confidence and lost my sense of self. The good news is I took a different direction. Once I accepted my condition and moved forward, I wrote a book on this subject. Um, I now host a podcast and um, co-chair of the Benzo Action Work Group, and also it just recently a published author on benzodiazepines. So a lot of progress. I wanna jump back real quick to the fluoroquinolones because this was brought up by, um, in a question, I think in one of the previous sessions, and, and Dr. Ritfo asked me to actually cover this quite briefly. I did take a fluoroquinolone prescribed by a urologist during my taper. And as many of you probably know, um, fluoroquinolones had an FDA box warning out of 2008 with several updates since then including warnings of um, mental health side effects, attention, disorientation, agitation, nervousness, memory impairment, delirium, and even irreversible peripheral neuropathy. And um, Professor Ashton, who wrote the Ashton Manual, um, for those who don't know, and she worked in a clinic with benzodiazepine withdrawal patients for a long period of time. She actually mentioned that antibiotics for some reason do sometimes aggravate withdrawal, but especially the fluoroquinolones and that they actually displace benzodiazepines from their um, binding sites on GABA receptors. And that has supposedly caused different um, consequences. I don't know if my protracted state is related somewhat to the quinolones and to bind, or if it's just bind, I probably will never know. But they, that may have also aggravated my condition. So misdiagnosis and prescribing of some certain medications can cause further problems. So I'll be uh, introducing the benzodiazepine experience survey. Uh, this was an online survey that was posted between October 2018 and January 2019. I was actually involved in its design and later on uh, Dee helped us out with the statistics. The aim of this survey was to assess the experiences of those taking tapering or having discontinued benzodiazepines. Um, and we actually had the results published in our first paper last month in Therapeutic Advances in Psychopharmacology, and we actually have several other papers planned and in development. I'm going to talk real briefly just on the demographics. We are going to go through these in several different portions of the rest of the um, presentation, so I thought it might be good just to give you a little background on the demographics of this study. There are 1,207 qualified respondents. Of those, 77% were from the United States. 72% were female, 26% male, and 2% were undisclosed. As for the age, over 53% of the people who took this were over the age of 50, and 92% were over the age of 30. So significantly it's skewed in the favor of um, people of the latter half of, the, um, of their lifespan. As far as types of benzodiazepines, one thing to point out is that some individuals did take multiple benzodiazepines on this study. And we actually allowed them to, um, to identify that within the study and noted that in some of our research papers. Clonazepam was taken by 53% of the people who took who responded. Alprazolam, 42%, um, lorazepam, 36%, and you can see the rest of the statistics there. As for those who took the drug as prescribed, 91% of respondents took their benzodiazepine definitely or mostly as prescribed. Only 9% said they definitely did not take them as prescribed. And as far as where these respondents are on their tapering status, 63% of the respondents were already off benzos, had completed tapering, or had quit cold turkey, and 35% were still taking or tapering the drugs. So um, we will be presenting the data from the survey um, as part of the, um, you know, the next modules that we're going to be talking about. But we did allow space at the end of the survey for write-in comments. And so I just wanted to share a few of those comments here. I think from the feedback we got from the survey, it, it seemed like some of the patients felt like we just couldn't adequately capture their experience with a bunch of, with, with you know, some of the questions that we asked during the survey. Um, so I'd just like to share some of the comments because I think they're very um, powerful. If I could think of the one worst possible thing you could do to a person, it would be benzo withdrawal. Beats cancer and Alzheimer's combined. 
After 30 minutes or 30 months of not taking benzos, one 10 year user said, I'm still so violently ill. I'm bedridden most days with symptoms. Benzos have completely destroyed my life. Existence is beyond torture. I do not believe I will survive. I was constantly coming down with mystery illnesses from the drug and these illnesses required additional medications to cover up the problems. Doctor never once acknowledged the pills could be the reason behind my issues. It is important that we be believed when we report how horrific the symptoms are that we have experienced and they can go on for many, many years. One of the most brutal aspects to my withdrawal experience is that I was not believed and even laughed at. So let's take a look at the bind description and what bind is and that definition that came out. One of the things to make really clear is, is differentiating between withdrawal and bind. And this is based on some of the very recent research that's been going on. As in our experience, we've identified that doctors are often trained to look at the symptoms of withdrawal. And here we're talking about the short duration symptoms, and we'll mention those in a little bit on this survey, but we're talking about seizures, hallucinations, whole body tremors, things like that. And those are typically the symptoms and usually with only about a seven to 28 day period to look for those and not to look for lingering neuro, um, neuroadaptation symptoms that we're talking about with bind. So we're trying to differentiate. And I think that's one of the problems we found that people weren't identifying this, this condition because they weren't taught to look for it. Other terminology we've used for this protracted state include protracted withdrawal, post-acute withdrawal, persistent or prolonged withdrawal syndrome, um, benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome, benzodiazepine injury syndrome, even benzo brain injury, and many others. And there was a lot of confusion. And this, of course, led both the survey team and a benzodiazepine nosology team through the Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices to work up some new terminology to try to find a term that may be able to constitute what this protracted condition is. And we came up with this. Um, that is benzodiazepine-induced neurological dysfunction, or BIND. And let me read this to you. BIND is a constellation of functionally limiting neurologic symptoms, both physical and psychological, that are the consequence of neuroadaptation and or neurotoxicity to benzodiazepine exposure. These symptoms may begin while taking or tapering benzodiazepines and can persist for weeks, months, or even years after discontinuation. This benzodiazepine nosology work group that was developed by the Alliance and came up with this actually pulled together 23 experts with mostly um, clinical and or lived experience. And the nosology paper is in development and will be coming out soon. And also this is mentioned in the series of um, reports that are, are papers that Christy and I are involved with with the benzodiazepine survey too. So one of the things we did come up with is we tried to categorize the symptoms that are typically experienced through this condition. And I took a while back when I wrote my book, um, I took Professor Ashton's list. And again, I will keep falling back on this. Professor Ashton did a lot of work on benzodiazepines early on and provided her manual online. And that's been the source of many people who have been recovering from this condition. And she came up with 14 categories, broken down into psychological and physical. When I wrote my book, I modified those a little bit and came up with the following list. Under psychological symptoms, we had seven categories, anxiety categories, including symptoms such as hypochondria, phobias, paranoid thoughts, behavioral symptoms like anger, irritability, obsessions, suicidal thoughts, personality changes, cognitive symptoms such as cognitive dysfunction and memory loss. Those are significant. I still deal with those. Intrusive memories are common, lack of concentration. Excitability symptoms are also very common with people with bind. I still have achesis, in fact, Last couple of nights have been relatively restless because my acosthesia was kicking and I was having trouble sleeping. Perception symptoms, DPDR, are very common. Hallucinations, perceptual disorders, distortions. Sleeping, of course, insomnia is very common. Insomnia, intrusive nightmares, um, toxic naps, sleep apnea, and of course, social. Agoraphobia, isolationism, emotional distancing. As for physical symptoms, we broke these down into kind of regional um, breakdowns. So considering a diminal, um, bleh, I can't talk, sorry. <laughs> and that, there goes that slurred speech that comes into play <laughs> as I do this kind of stuff. Abdominal or gastrointestinal symptoms, including abdominal pain, um, inflammation, nausea. Benzo belly is a term that is very prominent within the benzo community and identifies a constellation of symptoms in the abdomen. Um, it includes often diarrhea, pain, um, aches, pelvic floor dysfunction, constipation, even abdominal distension. When I've seen pictures of some people with this where both men and women look like they're seven to eight weeks pregnant because of the extreme distension. 
Symptoms of the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth, nose and mouth include difficulty swallowing, dry mouth, sight, sound and light sensitivity. For the head and neck, we have balance issues, dizziness. I had a lot of vertigo while taking the drugs. Slurred speech, as we just mentioned, throat tightening. Heart and lung symptoms, of course, heart palpitations are very common and many people wind up in the ER with chest pain. Air hunger and gasping, I can speak to personally, those can be very frightening to people. Muscular symptoms, as many of you all know, um, most benzodiazepines are excellent muscle relaxants. So when that's removed, not only are we facing with the neurological damage, but also um, muscles that have been locked up for months or even years sometimes. And we can pull, I've pulled several muscles, torn some, there's tremors, twitches, convulsions. Nerve sensations include altered sensations, numbness, paresthesia, formication. And of course, immune and endocrine symptoms, menstrual difficulties, sexual dysfunction, and increased infections. Through the survey um, that Christy and I were working on, we came up with top 12. And these were the top 12 symptoms identified by the survey based on the ones that they was asked on the survey. And um, this is based on frequency. So the number of people who experienced them, nervousness, anxiety, and fear had 88%, sleep disturbances, 87%, low energy, 86%, and difficulty focusing, 85%. And these were also often the more common long-term symptoms. When we looked at the duration of symptoms, these are the ones that lasted the longest. So I'll be discussing the life effects of BIND. Um, as I said in my um, one minute story earlier, it's not that it's, this is just a laundry list of symptoms that Dee just presented. Um, this has um, multiple life effects basically in every area of a patient's life. And I can honestly say that everything listed on this slide beyond, um, you know, the being involved with the judicial system, I had this, these effects in my own life. Uh, but patients um, often experience loss of career, which leads to financial hardship. So uh, patients are losing their income and along with that also their medical insurance. Um, at the same time, um, because of the number of, you know, physical and mental symptoms, uh, patients end up with a lot of healthcare costs. I, I probably spent $30,000, $40,000 at, at least on my healthcare costs. Um, and I think I just stopped counting it after a certain point. Um, as you'll hear later, this is a um, profoundly affects family and relationships um, regarding the judicial system. I mean, these drugs are associated with uh, violence and um, impaired judgment. And so patients occasionally have run-ins with the law. Um, and then I think the worst part for me was just the disability and the loss of my independence. Um, I was often confined to my home, um, difficulty driving and mobility impaired. Also, it's very difficult for me to walk towards the end of my taper. And, you know, all of this, you know, loss of independence and all these other losses translate into loss of confidence and self-esteem for patients. Um, we did ask about life effects in the benzodiazepine experience survey, and we specifically asked about the, um, the following areas, um, fun and hobbies, social interaction, ability to take care of home and others, relationships with spouse and family, work life, and ability to drive and walk. And you can see that, um, you know, it's between 70 to 80 percent in all of these areas, of 70 to 80 percent of the respondents were affected. So this you know, this was huge for patients. And we also asked about some of the uh, following consequences um, of withdrawal. Um, some of the lifestyle effects that really stood out was for 57% had significantly affected marriage and other relationships, 47% lost a job or weren't able to work. Um, and 54% expressed suicidal thoughts or attempted suicide. Um, regarding suicide, um, Alexis touched on this last week, uh, but there was a review of 17 studies um, published in uh, 2017 that showed that benzodiazepines can be associated with an increased suicide risk. Um, and definitely, I definitely have seen this in both with my own personal experience and also um, through advocacy, the, the patients I've talked with through advocacy as well. Um, 
First of all, it's well known that suicidal ideation can be a side effect or withdrawal symptom of benzodiazepines. And these often show up in the form of random intrusive thoughts that um, encourage self-harm. I personally would have these random thoughts out of the blue that I needed to stab myself with a pair of scissors, even though I didn't really particularly want to die at that moment. And it was terrifying. Um, and then after I came off the medication and had a couple of months of healing time, I've never experienced that again. Um, with patients who experience bind, there's also a weariness that sets in from the severity and persistence of these symptoms. I mean, when you have 80 symptoms going on for years on end and you really can't see your way out and don't know if these symptoms are going to improve, then it's really hard to keep going on. And I would say there was a four to five year period where I was very ill and didn't know if things were going to get better. And it, it really just became a, a battle of the will and just trying to keep hope alive that things would get better. And luckily in my case, they, they did. Lack of support is a constant um, issue with people going through BIND. When Benzo Buddies did a survey of 493 participants, they identified where their core source of support came from. As you can see on this chart, online support constituted over 50%. Family and friends constituted 40% of their support. Unfortunately, psychiatrists, general practitioners, therapists, and inpatient facilities were all under 20%. And this kind of identifies where a lot of the support had to be sought for people going through buying because they couldn't get support often from the medical establishment. And I'm going to talk about lack of support as it relates to uh, patients seeking help from the medical community. We did ask in our survey, were you warned that benzo should only be taken for short times or that they are difficult to withdraw from? And 76% of respondents said definitely not. Only 6% said, yes, they were clearly warned. And you know, the question in my mind has been, why weren't these patients warned? Um, and you know, from my standpoint, I can tell you that when I went through my internal medicine training, I received very little information about how to properly taper a benzodiazepine um, or the, about the risk of physical dependence. Um, so I, I feel like there's just a lot of knowledge gaps um, there from the standpoint of the, the medical community. And that's translating into patients not getting enough informed consent about the harms of these medications. And the FDA actually backs us up um, on this. Um, when they updated the box warning back, to, back in September of 2020, they actually did a pretty extensive review of benzodiazepines prior to releasing that warning. And in that review, they stated that there's a lack of awareness or misconceptions among prescribers about appropriate management of patients taking benzodiazepines. So um, specifically, one of the things they reviewed was their adverse events database. And they looked at, at 104 adverse events. And common themes that they found were misdiagnosis of benzo withdrawal or adverse effects, which led to, um, instead of tapering off the benzodiazepines, patients were actually increased on their dose of benzodiazepine. And it also led to unnecessary medical testing and um, polypharmacy, which um, obviously can cause more problems with their own side effects and drug interactions. Um, and then patients were told some er erroneous things as far as tapering. They were told they could stop the benzodiazepine abruptly since it was at a low or therapeutic dose and the patients ended up having withdrawal because of that. Other patients were told to taper too quickly. Um, they were told that they could just cut the dose in half. And the FDA did uh, postulate that if these patients had been allowed to do a gradual taper at their own pace, that some of these adverse effects could have been um, maybe not prevented, but at least mitigated. And lastly, I'd just like to read you this quote from a Psychiatric Times article in 2018. This uh, particular article uh, reviewed online drug communities um, for, or online communities for psychiatric drugs, including antidepressants and benzodiazepines. And uh, this talks more about, you know, the lack of physician understanding on this issue. And what it says is while that it might initially seem that these communities and video blogs are simply artifacts of the internet culture, a closer look at the stories told on these forums suggests a different message. 
The message is that physicians have been unprepared for these withdrawal disorders and are unable to treat or even guide patients through complicated withdrawal from these substances. And then we've just listed here some of the issues that arise um, when patients you know, present to um, the medical community um, with symptoms of BIND. Um, first of all, as Dee dis discussed earlier in the presentation, um, there can be confusion uh, whether these symptoms are withdrawal versus BIND, and doctors are all, often, not, um, often not considering that symptoms can be lasting for more than this 28-day period. Um, and there's also concern that, are, are we also, um, see now I'm getting <laughs> a lapse in a words here, but uh, we're also, there's also concern that this could be a relapsing or relapse of the patients um, or, or it could be a new medical condition cropping up basically. And uh, basically here you just have to use your clinical judgment and also talk with the patient and you know they'll often be able to tell you if they think this is related to the benzodiazepine. A lot of the patients um, in the benzodiazepine community become distrustful um, because they're often not believed by their doctor and many often as you'll hear later turn to alternative medicine. And we talked about the lack of informed consent. I wanted to let you know there's a um, informed consent form um, both on the consortium's website and also BIC as well. And I actually helped author this form and it's uh, for use in clinical practice. And it's got all of the information that I wish I had been told before accepting a prescription for a benzodiazepine. Great, thanks, Christy. Um, as for family and relationships, they can have a take a big hit during this time. According to our study, 85% of survey respondents claim negative effects on family and home and factors, many factors can, can affect this. Um, first off, misunderstanding and disbelief can be big with anybody on by. Number one, of course, if, if the medical community isn't backing or saying that this is a condition, then how is anybody in your family gonna believe it? Um, and also based on its severity and duration, and those are the two keys that make it very difficult for people to, especially for caretakers to stay with somebody. Um, it's, it, it's hard to believe because it lasts so long for some of us. And the severity can be intense, as in, as in um, Dr. Huff mentioned earlier, about an inability to take care of a child or drive. There can be so many effects of this that happen. Loss of income is another significant factor because as I, myself, I can share, I lost my job, can no longer work in that job. And I had to find a new career that I could function in and be able to work with. And I love my new career doing this and doing what I'm doing. And it's been a great move for me, but it wasn't voluntarily. It was kind of pushed on me because I could no longer do what I used to do. Loss of libido and intimacy can be significant during this time. And of course, we mentioned earlier, anger and irritability can also be primary factors in um, causing difficulties within a family or within relationships. We have found that therapy can be beneficial for these and sometimes is essential in helping any kind of um, group of friends or a family situation, a family group to get through the situation. One of the things, another study that Benzo Buddies looked at was the benefits of online support for those who sought online support. What benefits did they get from it? Um, finding support was the largest one. Um, and you can see this is broken down between benzos alone or benzos and Z drugs for those who aren't familiar. Z drugs do appear and non-benzodiazepines do appear to have similar effects when it comes to bind as benzodiazepines. And that's why we include them in some of the studies we do. But support was number one, information and advice was number two. Um, number three was validation and that's significant. Um, through my podcast, I work with a few thousand each month working with people that are um, going through this. And I would say validation might even be the number one thing that I provide. It's basically saying, Yes, I believe you. Yes, this is real, what you're going through. Yes, we will get through this together. We'll find a way. But it's just having somebody who's been there to get through it and help you out. Uh, Christy, that's you. Yeah, that's me. This slide covers <laughs> actually an article I wrote back in 2018 that covered my experience with uh, Benzo online support groups. And I wrote about it from the perspective of the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good parts of my experience, I was able to obtain support from individuals with similar experiences. Um, 
from that, I got emotional support. And I also made uh, lifelong friends. Um, you know, I, I bonded with people that were going through a similar phase of the taper as I was, and we still talk even today. The bad part is uh, these um, online sites, there's, they can be very triggering. There's people that post horror stories, there's talk of suicide. It's also very draining to support other members when you're sick yourself. Um, and lastly, um, misinformation. This is a popular word in the time of COVID, but um, again, I wrote this in 2018. So there's nothing new about bad medical advice being shared on the internet. So people have to really be discerning when they use these websites. Is this good information or is this bad information? And what I've got listed here is the ugly is that these groups exist because BIND is not currently recognized um, either in the public or the medical community. Uh, and this translates in there being no formal support system for these patients. So the internet is really the only place that they can go. And lastly here, we're gonna cover uh, non-medication management of symptoms. Uh, next week, Alexis will be talking about deprescribing and she'll share some of the medication management, but we just wanted to list some of the non-medication options here. So first, uh, counseling and therapy. Actually, CBT is very well um, documented in the literature to be helpful in managing benzodiazepine discontinuation. This was covered in a 2017 New England, New England Journal Review article on the treatment of benzodiazepine dependence. And also there's a, um, a well-respected 2018 evidence-based clinical practice guideline on the prescribing benzos, and it recommends CBT specifically as a non-drug approach for the management of insomnia. CBT can help develop coping skills and help patients manage psychosocial stressors, and that can ease the withdrawal process um, if possible. And you'll hear this um, from Dee later on in a minute when he discusses peer support, but it's, it's important to use a therapist who's familiar with the unique challenges of BIND. And that's just because it's, it's so much easier for patients to um, relate um, to the therapist. Uh, there are some limitations with therapy and it may just depend on the, the stage that your patient is in because cognitive impairment and other symptoms may interfere with the patient's ability to retain new skills and put them into practice. Um, I actually went through um, counseling uh, when I was um, in Xanax interdose withdrawal and I would have this blinding chemical terror. I won't even call it anxiety. And he was asking me to to be mindful and to really focus on what I was doing. And I, I just couldn't do it. You know, I feel like later on, now that I'm feeling much more healed, maybe, you know, that would be much more beneficial. So really just pay attention to what stage your patient is in this healing process. A lot of patients have turned to, of course, alternative treatments and supplements, um, again, because they've had little other support in different areas. Often with uh, um, the two things to point out really important here. And one is, people's experience within BIND is very individual. We have seen a, a, a wide spectrum of treatments that work, of things that don't work back and forth. And it's really difficult to find out what will work for the individual. And that's why we often wind up with trial and error. Many um, patients have to decide on themselves what works for them. Um, and so they have to go through this trial and error process. I did that with many things. I would try supplements. I would try different diets. I would try different exercises. I would try a series of things. And most of us have just trying to find that one thing that might slightly ease my symptoms and help me to feel a little bit better. Many treatments like massage, acupuncture, functional medicine have been used by several different patients with some success. Supplements, again, are one of those ones that are hit and miss. Many have tried natural herbs, vitamins, melatonin, gabapentin, you, you name it. They've tried several different things to help. I've seen this, and I think Christy has seen this too, that it, it, it hits and misses. While one person will say natural herbs saved me and got me through it, somebody else will say that just added to my symptoms and made them 10 times worse. So it does seem to be very individual. Um, I also did try CBD THC being in Colorado. I was able to do that. I tried primarily CBD initially. I also tried it with some THC later via tinctures. Um, I didn't get much benefit, but I do know people who try that, of course, since anxiety increases your symptoms, many people are out trying to figure out any way to calm themselves and to ease that anxiety and stress. 
But of course, as we all know, those also come with their own complications and can make things worse. As far as coping skills and lifestyle modifications, this is where I think we in the Benzo community, especially the work I've done through the podcast can help the most. Um, I, talk, I talk about anxiety management tools all the time. Um, anything that helps to reduce anxiety, helps to reduce stress can be beneficial for people because the more anxiety equals more symptoms or more severe symptoms. We've seen this time in and time out. If we can find a way to ease those, that anxiety to ease the stressors in their lives, we can help to reduce the severity of their symptoms. Acceptance has become very vital and I hear this repeatedly. Many of us go through the five stages of grief as we go through this process and reaching that level of acceptance to realize, okay, this is me, this is where I am now, now what can I do to make it a little better? Um, and reaching that acceptance has been a key point. Distraction is very common. Um, we realize it's not a long-term solution for sure. We need to make sure we're still part of the world and part of everything that goes on, but distracting yourself from your symptoms and sometimes from triggers can be beneficial, especially when you're having such severe symptoms. Exercise can be very beneficial, but it also has its own limitations because of the lack of um, the muscle relaxants in our body and the different um, nerve consequences. We can pull, months, pull muscles, tear muscles, and I have done that through mine. Um, we are often pushed too hard, so it's important to make sure the patients listen to their bodies as they're going through this and not push things too hard. Diet can be essential. I was on a diet of chicken and white rice for over a month at one point because of my extreme benzo belly symptoms. Sleep hygiene is very helpful, of course. Meditation and yoga, I experienced, I did both of those and they did help. And of course, any type of stress reduction can be beneficial. Peer support, of course, is also a key component for many people going through um, BIND. Primary tool for ongoing support, those with lived experience, it's much like a veteran coming out of post-war trauma with PTSD. Other veterans understand what they've been through and BIND is similar in that regard. We get it, we can create that connection and we can help them. And that's why um, we're doing a lot of work in that direction. Types of peer support include online groups, um, coaching groups, social media, in-person support groups. By far, online has been the primary source of this support, but even those are expanding. Um, I'm a guest on um, one of the morning shows, and we'll talk about her, her um, program in a little bit. And she just provides this, this online community. It's a paid membership community, but it's an online community just providing ongoing support. And this has been needed for many individuals. We do have some peer support documentation online at our Benzodiazepine Action Work Group, and you can find that on our website at benzoaction.org. And of course, we are actually in development, I wanted to mention this, on benzodiazepine peer support training program. Both Dr. Huff and myself are involved in that program. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is currently in development in association with Ginger Ross at Choices Training. We are feeding off of recovery coach training programs. So we are using that and we're creating a separate module specific to benzodiazepines. We have six core members, all members of the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group working on that. Dr. Ritvo and Dr. Huff are involved. Terry Schreiber out of the Schreiber Research Group, Nicole Lamberson out of Benzodiazepine Information Coalition, and Trina Fates out of the Boulder County Substance Use Advisory Group are all involved in that core team and doing amazing work developing this criteria. We're hoping to have this completed by the end of 2022. And that brings us to resources. Christy and I will both go through these real briefly with you, and then we can jump into our Q&A. As far as lead organization resources, I'm going to mention a few of these, and I'm going to let Christy mention BIC. Benzodiazepine Action Work Group, you can find at benzoaction.org, and we are with the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. We have several documents online. We do a lot of work. We have four simultaneous projects right now that peer support documentation, this training, um, we have a speakers bureau, we have um, all these documents online, we're doing a lot and keeping busy. Alliance for Benzodiazepine Best Practices, led by Bill, Bernie Silvernail, and of course, Dr. Alexa Ritbo, which you all know from the other sessions, is the medical director there, um, have, are doing amazing work and have done a lot of work. They were part of the FDA um, alert recently. They do a lot of research and often help to educate both physicians and patients. My site is Easing Anxiety. I got to give us a, a quick plug to that. Um, it's mostly Benzo information, and it's also the home of the Benzo Free podcast. And um, Chris, you want to take over BIC in the next slide? Sure. So BIC or BIC, whichever you want to call it, uh, we have a lot of information on our website for both patients and prescribers about benzodiazepines, both safe um, prescribing and also safe deprescribing or tapering. 
Uh, we also um, have a web page where we encourage people to report their um, benzodiazepine adverse effects to the FDA MedWatch program. And we keep we have a free um, Ashton manual available for download, download and also um, a list of benzodiazepine cooperative doctors. And actually we've got that listed under physician resources here. So on our website, the cooperative doctors list and also the um, Ashton manual, either PDF or Kendall form. And then also these mentioned the Benzo Action website, definitely check that out in addition to the informed consent form uh, that I already mentioned. And you can use, you know, starting today in your clinical practice, we also have um, prescribing and deprescribing guidances that um, the group of us, you know, work very hard on those. And they're basically some general guidance for your uh, clinical practice. Additional patient resources include um, largest forum out there for some time has been Benzo Buddies. It can be hit and miss. Um, there is some misinformation on there, so we always try to caution people about it, but it is the largest forum on Benzo information that has helped many individuals. Benzo Warrior is another organization that we've been working with, and they're members of our Benzo Action Work Group and are doing great work in discussion groups and other areas, and we're starting to work more in um, we're starting to integrate them more in a lot of the work we're doing. And of course, there's plenty other discussion groups, Facebook groups, and support groups on the web. For coaching and therapy, um, we did list two people here. Both of these individuals have lived experience and provide online support and often direct coaching and even group support for people going through benzodiazepines. They are both counselors, um, Jennifer Lee, and of course, Baylissa Frederick. And we've had good experience with them and are, are, are willing to recommend them and put them on this list. Um, for peer support, uh, BOG peer support guiding document. Um, we talked about, I talked about peer earlier and that is actually on our website, that document. And of course, I also mentioned our training program um, that we're in development. And of course, um, closing out this slide with my podcast, I've been doing my podcast for three years now, over three years, I have over a hundred episodes out and um, been working with individuals. I get correspondence with them daily and I work with people daily going through this and um, I've learned so much from them. And I just want to say thank you to them because they have taught me so much about what BIND is and what this condition is like and, and the experience. Christy, you want to take the contact list here? Sure. So um, you've got our contact information here. Um, you can contact me via email or Twitter and benzoinfo.com is our website. And um, you can reach Dee at his email or website listed here. And um, I guess we're ready to take questions now. Um, and again, if you haven't visited the Benzo Action Work Group page, there's lots of good things going on there. Um, uh, so please check that out. I think Susanna might have had a comment or question or two. Maybe to kick yeah, us off. Yeah, we can just start at the top um, and okay. go down. So that I think we have time, plenty of time. Um, so the first comes from Paul. And he says, has there been any attempt to secure representation from a class action law firm against pharmaceutical companies? Um, I think we both can speak to that a little. Christy, you might have some more. I've, I've seen the attempts and I've seen people trying. And of course, some people have individual success. And there was a class action lawsuit in UK a while back. It unfortunately failed, um, had, had some setbacks and funding difficulties. Um, but there have been some individual lawsuits that have worked in the UK and the US not so much that I've seen. Um, Christy, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, my understanding is it's pretty difficult because the drug has it's in generic form now, and I think it's easier to uh, sue the you know the brand name manufacturer. So that's what I've been told. And yes, I did know I know about the the UK class action that did fail, but I don't think anybody ever got organized over here, as far as I know. Yeah. Next question from Jeff. Based on your investigation and experience, what has been the extent, duration, and quality of psychotic symptoms that people may suffer from during the after, from during or after the taper or withdrawal process? You want to take that one, Christy? Yeah. So I don't believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Dee, but I don't believe that we asked about psychotic symptoms in the survey itself. Not specifically, no. Yeah. But so just, I guess my anecdotal experience, um, among people that taper, I think the psychotic symptoms are rare. People that, you know, very rapid taper or abruptly discontinued, yes, that happens. And I think those are more relatively short duration oh, yeah. symptoms. 
I mean, uh, again, this is just generally speaking and anecdotal. Yeah, we have had, of course, misdiagnosis too with people with psychotic conditions when actually it was more related to bind and we've seen that repeatedly, so. Right, yeah, it does happen. Uh, and this question came from Sam uh, and they emailed me directly as they're not able to be here today. And they were wondering, can brain atrophy result from a too fast cold turkey taper and or withdrawal? I don't know, can you speak to specifically to brain atrophy, Christy? So I believe that Malcolm Ladder did some studies hinting at possible structural brain abnormalities, but I don't yeah. think anything ever really came of that. So we don't really have any literature documenting that that occurs. I mean, it's not to say that it couldn't happen. We just don't have any studies to. Yeah, yeah the truth is we're, we're really lacking on that evidence. And like you said, Malcolm did make did some of the surveys way, way back and hinted at it, but it wasn't proven. Um, that is a common question we get all the time, I think through our support, and I think Christy does too, is, is this permanent? And that's been asked repeatedly to us. Um, our answer is we really don't know. Um, is it possible? Yes. For so the neuroadaptation and neurotoxicity, some of these conditions may not be reversible. We don't know. Um, but of course, we're also very cautious to how we provide that information to people who are going through this because that can be triggering information. So we always have to be very careful as to how I present this. But the truth is we still need more research. We have seen people heal from the worst. Um, the first person I had on my podcast was um, Elizabeth McCarthy. And she cold turkey off of 20 milligrams clonazepam. And she, for the most part, has recovered. And so I've seen extreme states where people can say, you know, they've recovered, although some of us takes up to 10 years. Unfortunately, I've seen some people at 10 years who finally say, I have finally healed. I'm at seven and a half and I still have symptoms. I am much improved, but I still have ongoing symptoms. And then we have a comment. Uh, I am an LCSW counseling uh, benzo and Z drug folks uh, with protracted withdrawal. Um, and I do presentations for universities and for the National Association of Social Work. I'm assuming that's what that is. Uh, the culture accepts benzos as effective and benign, especially in the pandemic. This is the biggest obstacle that I'm finding. Emily, I don't know if you wanted to unmute yourself and share anything else. I know you had your hand raised as well. Oh. Thanks. Um, yeah, this, I started uh, doing these presentations in the last year and a half. I'm also lived experience on five and a half years off of Lunesta and an uninformed withdrawal uh, years earlier off of Ativan. So uh, when I do uh, these presentations, like the pharmaceutical students and the like, they really don't know anything i mean that's really not an exaggeration for me much of the time and um i recently did it at um, wilkes university in northeast pennsylvania and found that they're aware that they're over prescribed but they are not aware of the dangers really uh, by the pharmaceutical students and the like so um, I do offer statistics, as you all know, about who actually suffers withdrawal, like what's the percentage and it, whether it's Ashton or um, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, it's anywhere from like 15 to 80 percent. And yeah, we've seen numbers across the board on that one, Emily. I yeah, agree. Yeah. yeah. And every year or so it comes out with a new percentage because we know there's not really good it is anecdotal, I guess. Um, so it's, I guess the remaining percentage survives, gets by, has no withdrawal, and that convinces medical community that these things are benign. Exactly. To be afraid of. So um, when I saw, you know, I'm talking to women that, especially childbearing age, that are with children stuck at home during lockdowns, prescribed Xanax generally, and then also drinking, that it amplifies, obviously, what it's doing to the receptors, uh, the GABA receptors, it amplifies it, and they're getting very ill, and discover they're in inner dose withdrawal. But the, I just want to convey that out here in the field, sort of, so to speak, that folks are not getting the message still, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's 
medicine. I don't know if the FDA was not more forthcoming. I don't know what it is, but they're not getting the message. I mean, even as recently as yesterday, a friend of mine said she's on Xanax now. Why? After what I told her. So I get, I'm sorry. I, it wasn't really a question. It's more like... No, no, it's a, it's a great point. And thank you. And I want to see if yeah. Chrissy wants to pipe in here. Yeah, too. No, I, I totally agree with that. We still have a lot more work to do in getting the, the message out there. I mean, I, I told you about my medical training, which was almost nil on this. I knew about addiction and I knew, you know, short term, but... I didn't think I could have trouble with these because I was just taking them as prescribed. So there, there's just a lot of, um, you know, disconnect out there and we just got a lot more education and, you know, today's lecture is a, is a start and we're going to continue yeah. working in that direction. A, a lot of, a lot of, I totally agree on both counts there, Emily, and is that there's a lot that needs to be done a lot and this is going to take time, but also the last year or two, I have seen, I think Christy has seen too, more progress that we've made in the, the 10 years prior. So we're making, and it's starting to happen. Unfortunately, as you know, it's going to take a long time for that education throughout the medical community to, to take place. It's going to be a lot of these seminars, a lot of, you know, a lot of new information. The FDA warning um, out, of two, uh, out of 2020 was huge and really backs our story, but we just got to keep at it and keep going. So what else we got? Yes, hold on. Uh, yes, Jen asked, uh, we're likely aware of the negative impacts and experiences of stigma yeah. related to substance use disorders in both the medical and general community, but how is a stigma experienced uh, by folks with BIND and what advice do you have to combat this? The great one. Chrissy, you want to start off on that one? Um, or do you want me to take it? Trying to read the question. Where is it? I'll start off and then you can pipe in. On, okay. on stigma, um, that's one of the things we're working on right now with that peer coach training that Christy and I are both involved with through the Benzodiazepine Action Work Group, um, because that is based off of SUD, of substance use disorder um, people, and of, of training and for recovery coaches. And so we're now figuring out differentiating between benzodiazepine and, you know, for SUD, because most people with benzodiazepines, now unless they, they do have a course street use and some people do become addicted or, or wind up with dependence, I mean, with, um, with an addictive type of problem with that, a substance use disorder. But most of the people we work with are people who have taken as prescribed, don't have cravings and um, are dealing with experiences such as bind and such. And that becomes an ongoing, you know, problem is how do we differentiate? Because a lot of people in the benzo community are put off by addiction terminology. And so we wanna be respectful of the SUD community and equally make sure we differentiate how benzodiazepines are often different and have their own issues. Christy, you wanna elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I finally found the question. I do better with reading okay. and listening. So, uh, okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, all brains work differently, right? But um, I think that, you know, I definitely experienced this stigma of, I was treated as if I had an addiction problem initially, and I was also treated as if I were experiencing, um, you know, a, a mental health diagnosis. Um, so I definitely felt stigma on both those fronts. So even, even if the, this, your anxiety symptoms are related to the, the benzodiazepine or you're having, um, or if you're just, you know, purely physical dependent, you can still, um, you know, have some of that stigma that those other communities are experiencing. Um, and and the, I, I think there's also just some stigma inherent in having kind of a chronic um, unexplained illness. Yeah, that's a good point. Then we have a question from Autumn who asks, what are your strategies when talking with people that feel benzodiazepines are the only thing that works for them to help them understand the risks of benzodiazepines? You want to lead off, Christy? Or? Yeah, so I think um, motivational interviewing is probably appropriate here um, and just kind of getting people to think about, you know, what are the long-term risks of these medications? How could your life potentially be better with them? And kind of go through this educational process of um, talking about, okay, what's our plan or exit strategy, how are we going to describe the de prescribe these medications and also just realizing that you know if somebody is on a long term benzodiazepines them coming off is not an emergency you have time to work with them over, you know, hopefully a period of 
of visits. And so just taking that time to get to know the patient and get to know where they are and kind of work on things yeah. over time. Yeah, it's, it's hard because we do get that. And that's one of the problems we have for establishing the case of bind is those people who do, don't seem to have a problem coming off. But for those who want to stay on and don't know, it's just difficult. One thing we always try to emphasize is we don't try to force anybody to withdraw, of course. Um, number one, it's, it can be a very difficult process. So we want to make sure that we have their buy-in you know, if they choose to withdraw. So I think that's important. And for some people, it is not the wise course of action. Um, for some people at later in life, um, you know, elderly, more terminal cases, stuff like that, sometimes benzodiazepine withdrawal is not appropriate. Um, and so there are certain things that happen. I did see on the chat real quick, I just want to mention that um, there was some debate about whether Baylissa Frederick was still um, taking um, the counseling patients with benzos. And it first said no, and then it sounds like that she is. So I think Nicole Lamberson um, actually piped in and said that she um, she is still, she started taking patients again. So just wanted to elaborate on that and make sure I mentioned that here. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer has her hand raised. So you feel free to unmute if you have a question or a comment. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, thank you. Thanks, you guys. This is really great. I just wanted to add, um, so I'm, I run a peer support or admin a peer support group online for women who have found difficulty with hormonal changes, which is something I didn't notice um, in your list of symptoms. And so um, after about a year of going through my own process with um, a very pronounced reaction to birth control, like my benzo prescription change, how I reacted to birth control, I started getting into that area. And so I would say now after a year of opening that forum, about once or twice a week, I have a woman come to me with complications, whether it be uh, menstrual changes or a reaction to birth control or a reaction to hormone replacement therapy or changes in menopause. Um, so I think hopefully in the future, we start talking more about um, the women's, you know, women's reproductive cycles and how there's some very big changes in that and how they're kind of working on a lot of women in our group are working on simultaneous withdrawals from benzodiazepines and from progesterones. And it can be very complicated and we don't have too, too much to work with. Um, so I just wanted to kind of poke my head in and say that. I Thank, think thanks. I'll let Christy answer that one, Jennifer, real quick though, that was actually on our chart under um, immune and endocrine symptoms. So we do talk about, it is on the chart of, of, that we presented. Oh, I missed it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you was, get overwhelmed when there's like 80, I know, right? don't worry about it. It's not your problem, but it is on there and <laughs> yes. it, is, it is common. Let me let Christy okay. answer more on the detail on that if it's okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think it's a really fascinating topic and I'm glad you raised it. I think it's something that definitely needs a lot of research. Of course, in a lecture like this, it's hard to really delve into one subject deeply, but yeah, I think it just bears further research. I know that, I know there's definitely some hormonal connection every time the week before, you know, my period would start, um, my benzo symptoms would go through the roof. And I've heard other women say that too. So there's, there's definitely something hormonal. And I think we definitely need more investigation. Maybe you can, you know, help up with that, Jen. Yeah, yeah, actually, Jen, uh, and uh, honestly, if you're ever interested in being a guest on the podcast, let me know, because I would love to talk more about subjects like that. Yeah, yeah, no, I would absolutely love to be. I just, I won't go on for too long, but I'm in Canada and I'm a PhD candidate here. I study um, benzodiazepine regulation. So kind of the politics around how we regulate um, the drugs and- Yeah, re um, reach out to both of us um, on email and we'll, we'll start talking. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, we do have one last question. I hope I know it's one o'clock, so feel free to hop off if you need to, or if you'd like to stay for more q and I think we uh, can stay on the line, but Paul wants to know if, if withdrawal is more difficult with the elderly, e.g. a patient in their 80s or 90s has been a, on the lowest dose of Xanax, 0.125 milligrams uh, for 25 years. Also, does the effect of Xanax increase if kidney function is decreased? Um, we have seen, and Christy, I think you've seen this too, we have seen that elderly do have more difficulty often coming off the drugs and with bind. Um, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag because they also have higher potential for side effects um, from falls and fractures and everything else. So we got to consider that. And of course, um, also um, cognitive decline. Both of those can be affected by the use of the drugs. Um, so it's usually good to try to get them off. But at the same point, I actually just went through this um, and I'm gonna try to say this without breaking down, but both my parents, I went through the last year, 
of their care. And I lost my mom in November and my dad in, in February, both with dementia and both were put on benzodiazepines during that case. And, and here I am a proponent against these drugs. And in both cases, I felt it was appropriate because it, it eased the ag agitation. They were nearing life's end and it was probably appropriate for them as long as they monitored their movement and falls and other you know, dangers, but they weren't gonna be recovering. So it was important at that stage, in my opinion, to do a pro con list and figure out if that was beneficial for them. Christy, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, and, and I think it just depends on the patient because again, we don't always know who's susceptible to bind. So, you know, some elderly patients may be able to get off the medication just fine and it's not problematic and other more others, it's gonna be more difficult. And so I think we just really have to be um, aware. And for, you know, for those that it's gonna be more difficult, it might make sense to um, just stay on the medication. Um, and I'm not sure if, I don't, think Xanax is cleared through the kidneys, but again, I'm not a psychopharmacologist, um, but so if anybody wants to chime in on- I don't know if Jeff's yeah. on or not, if he wants to pipe in. I think yeah, he's on. Yeah, I mean, I would check with, definitely check with the pharmacist or- Jeff, you there? On that, maybe gone. I, I saw him on chat, so I don't know if he jumped up, but he was on chat a second ago. Yeah, so Dr. Gold will probably know that one probably pretty quickly, but I don't know that he's still on, so. Yeah, it looks like he may have hopped off. Okay, yeah. thanks, oh. Susanna. Uh, I think we have a couple more. Hold on, my scrolling is failing me. Uh, what do you think about getting referred a patient on benzodiazepines that a PCP started on Xanax and is now requesting help managing or tapering? Is this unethical? Christy, you want to start? Uh, what do you think about getting referred a patient? I mean, I guess who who's getting the referral, I guess, is my question. Is this a psychiatrist or? I, um, I'm i Jose Vasquez. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know whether it's an ethical if um, I mean, if that's your area of expertise and you're there, you know, there to help that patient with a taper, I think that's um, you know, the patient's obviously in a bit of a pickle and they need help getting off the medication. So, I mean, I, sure, I'd say, I'd say do it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, JC wants to know, does the reinstatement work? I think sometimes people's bodies are so damaged from benzodiazepines that their nervous systems can't function without them anymore. We, with the reinstatement, we have to be careful of kindling. And that's always our concern is, you know, once somebody goes back on the drug, there's, there's a possibility of kindling, which means that of course, coming off it again is going to be that much diff more difficult. Um, the repeated attempts at trying to taper off these drugs can be difficult. And so we're always nervous about that. But at the same point, I have had many people um, who have reinstated. Um, and I also try to make sure I realize we also got to consider suicidality in this mix. And sometimes the distress is so extreme that their only out may be reinstatement. And that's, I think, a delicate balance to have with people is, you know, monitoring their mental state along with what they can have, encouraging them to taper on their own pace as they can do so. But if they feel like once they're off, they have to reinstate, you have to weigh, the, weigh that with that. Christy, you got something on that? Yeah, I mean, I think from what we've seen, reinstatement is a mixed bag. Um, so sometimes it can be helpful for the patient to go back on and then taper slower or, and it sometimes it actually makes things worse. And yes, the kindling effect is always a risk, but yes, we always also have to be mindful that suicide is a risk. And if pe people are just so miserable with symptoms and that could potentially help them, then you know it, it should always be reserved as an option. Yeah. I saw one on there real quick from Paul. That's for you, Christy. It said, should cardiologists be prescribed benzos like Xanax or should only psychiatrists be involved? What's your opinion on that? Yeah. So that's kind of an interesting question. As a cardiologist, I never ever prescribed a benzo and, but I've run across a few patients that were actually prescribed a benzo by their cardiologist. And I just, I just thought that was the strangest thing because they, they were using it to treat hypertension when we have so many other um, good medications available. So my answer would be, I personally can't think of a good reason for a cardiologist to be prescribing 
benzos. I, I always felt like it would be better for the patient's primary doctor or a psychiatrist to be managing to manage that if that was something that they felt that they needed. But that seemed to be kind of out of, it felt like it was out of my area of expertise back in my prescribing days as a cardiologist. And Dr. Ridvo did pipe in on chat too and mentioned that majority of benzodiazepines are prescribed in primary care, which is true. So that's kind of where most of them are coming from. And unfortunately, maybe not always with, with the education that they need to be able to provide. Yeah, it looks like Ginger is raising the issue. Benzo prescribed by oncology is adjunct treatment for chemo-induced yeah. nausea and vomiting. And yeah, that, that is actually um, pretty common. And I would say the oncologists, you know, they have a, some experience with that, um, obviously, because they're prescribing that on a regular basis. Um, but, you know, I had, a, I had a friend actually that was prescribed Ativan without adequate informed consent during her chemo days. And she was trapped on the medication. She was never able to taper off before she, she died. And it pretty much ruined her last, the last, um, you know, her time of remission from her cancer. So it's something that we need to be aware of. Thanks, Emily, for sharing your contact as well. That looks like that was, oh, how common are seizure, is seizures in catatonia? Um, they seem to be more common. Chris, you can back me on this one if you want to. Um, they seem to be more common by far with cold turkey or sudden cessation of benzodiazepines. That's where we see them most commonly. I'm not saying it can't happen in slow tapers, but usually it only happens, usually it happens at, you know, abrupt cessation. So that's where it often kicks in. And that was more of the withdrawal process that we found. Um, versus and I would the say if process. you're doing it right, you shouldn't be seeing seizures. You need to yeah. please don't stop anyone abruptly from a bit of Exactly. Yeah. Can withdrawal cause? Uh, oh, we're pulling out the cardiology questions. Can withdrawal cause <laughs> supraventricular tachycardia? I would say yes, it could. Anything that uh, kind of puts that super or that sympathetic nervous system over the edge can make you more likely to go into a supraventricular arrhythmia. So yeah, that's definitely a risk with that, especially if you have underlying, underlying heart problems to start with. Yeah, it's important to remember that withdrawal from, was it Ben, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from withdrawal and from alcohol and benzodiazepines are the two that can be fatal if it's done, you know, if it's not managed properly. So it's important to realize that withdrawal from benzodiazepines, abrupt withdrawal can, can be fatal in some patients. So mm -hmm. got to always be careful of that. All right, I don't see any more questions. Great. Great uh, questions so everybody. thank you for those of you who were able to stay on. We hope that you're all able to uh, join us next week for our last series uh, or last yes. webinar in the series. Can I um, pipe in one thing, Susanna? JC yeah. just piped in with uh, many people have died in prison jail. Um, and real quick, for those who want more information in that area, I, thank you, JC. J, by the way, JC is the director at Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. And um, one of the perfect ones here in Colorado is John Patrick Walters. Just Google that and look it up, and you will see a case directly of benzodiazepine abrupt discontinuation within prisons. It's a very sad story to read, but it's an important one to know about. So sorry, I just wanted to pipe, put that in there real quick. Oh, no. Good to know. Yep. Thanks, Dee. So okay. our last webinar in the four-part series will be next week on uh, deprescribing and tapering. So we hope that you're able to make it same time. Uh, it'll be Tuesday at 12 p.m. And if you have any questions in the meantime for any of our presenters, feel free to reach out to them directly. And as Dee sh is sh showing on the screen, um, you can go to benzoaction.org, which will lead you right to our work group page. If you're interested in learning more about any of these additional resources or joining us, uh, you can do all of that that way. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.